Welcome to the Citizens Report for the 12th of June 2020. I'm Elisa Barwick. Joining me today is Citizens Party Research Director Robert Barwick. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Elisa. And on today's show, bail-in is a clear and present danger. And the fix is in how foreign influence has rigged a parliamentary inquiry. So first up today, bail-in is a clear and present danger. Before we start, Elisa, I just want to give people an update on the National Bank campaign that we've been running for the last um, few months, um, which does relate to the bail-in issue, of course, because it's all about fundamentally reforming the financial system. But we've had a campaign to uh, expand the existing institution that is used for renewable energy, the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, into a powerful national development bank, right? Well, that idea was conceived in the context of the coronavirus lockdown of the economy and the, you know, the understanding that parliament might not be sitting until August and things like that. Those, those factors have changed. Um, another thing that's come up is, to, is there's a rule, there's an arcane rule in parliament that is actually blocking us from tabling legislation to adapt this existing institution into a standalone bank. And it's, it's sort of too complicated to explain, it, but it basically applies to if you're not a member of the government, um, that is, if you're, a, if you're in the opposition or in a minor party in parliament, you're not allowed to introduce a bill that involves any government spending at all. The thing to understand, this is an extra constitutional rule. It's not in the constitution. These are the sort of rules parliament comes up with, and it's a way of keeping parliament under control. Because what I argue is, I argue, well, if you're not a member of the government, it's unlikely to pass anyway. Why do they need this kind of rule? You're not allowed to even table it. Because, of course, if you do table it and you have it in there, then circumstantially, you know, there's nothing in the law that says people have to vote with the parties, right? Yeah. In fact, parties aren't constitutional. They're not in the constitution. Um, the, 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 you know, if, if the majority of people in the House of Representatives support this, this, pr this proposal in the context of this, what's happening in the world now and in Australia now, that, yeah, they, they suddenly decide, yeah, this is an emergency, we've got an unemployment crisis, we need a national development bank, we're going we're to back it. Mm -hmm. Who cares if it was put up by someone not from the government, i.e. Bob Catter, right? Um, and so you see where this kind of rule comes in as a way to control things and keep it under control. So we've run up against that. But what it actually means is an opportunity for us because the, the, the first proposal of expanding the CF, CEFC was sort of an ad hoc way of accomplishing a national development bank. Now we have an opportunity to implement a proper national development bank. Um, it will not be affected by the same rule in the same way. We've had legislation introduced before. So we're preparing a proper standalone dedicated national development bank. It follows what was, we announced last week where the United States Congress has had a, a national infrastructure bank um, uh, tabled there, right? And this, this is a real, th there's a lot of potential there. If they do it, this will be noted, you know, whatever happens over there, it definitely gets noticed by our parliament here, right? And we might be, there's already support in the parliament and, and um, they can get around this dedicated proposal. So we'll be, we're, we're working on the, the new legislation now. That'll take a little while. We'll keep people um, uh, updated. But people should still keep calling members of parliament and demand they back the idea of a national development bank because this, this, this will happen sooner than you think. And the support is growing. Those calls are working. And we want to play now a clip of, of a little segment of a speech, a fragment of a speech that was given yesterday by the uh, Liberal Party Senator from Queensland, Jared Rennick, who was talking, gave a Senator statement in the context of the, you know, what has to happen um, uh, with, the, with the, uh, the state of the economy now. And he made this a feature of his speech. Just have a watch. The first measure that must be addressed is monetary policy. Australia does not need foreign capital, and the cheerleaders who advocate this should actually take the time to understand what real capital is. Our people and how they exploit our nation's untapped wealth for themselves and their children. The father of modern Australia, Lachlan Macquarie, knew this when he introduced the holy dollar as a means to fund the building of new infrastructure. Quite simply, a country cannot protect its sovereignty or manage its economy if it doesn't control its currency or its critical infrastructure. The Reserve Bank must fund an infrastructure bank that will underwrite nation-building projects. An infrastructure bank is where monetary policy meets fiscal policy, and it is the link that governments need to grow our economy. 
If there has been a fundamental flaw in the Western government's response to the GFC, it has been propping up inefficient companies and banks instead of building productive infrastructure, like China, whose economy has grown strongly because of its commitment to nation-building infrastructure. Let's not forget, 50 years ago, China was coming out of the Cultural Revolution, yet today it has managed to pull out a billion people out of poverty because its central bank, and not foreign banks, funded the development of infrastructure. So that's a very important point that Senator Rennick has made, Elisa, that we need a national infrastructure bank is what makes other economies very successful. We need to have a successful productive economy here and this can help make it happen. And I'll refer people again to the interview I did a few weeks ago with Dr Peter Brain, which is on our YouTube channel. People should watch that and see how Dr Brain explains it. Right? So yeah. get behind this um, fight, keep, keep fighting with us, sign the petition we still have circulating for a national development bank and help us get this idea out there. Yes, this is a matter of life and death for Australia's economy because we are on the precipice of a very grave crisis which was there the whole time uh, but it's just been exacerbated and really brought to a, a brink by the lockdown. Um, and we want to talk a bit about the possibilities of bail-in um, people's uh, savings and investments of various kinds, bonds and so forth, being confiscated to saving banks in this environment. Um, now, this was... Um, not discussed in an article that we're about to talk about by Alan Kohler in The Australian on the 8th of June. He didn't raise this, but he raised the backdrop of why we're saying this is going to happen, this is going to be on the immediate agenda. Uh, the article D-Day looms for banks over $224 billion in loans, discussed all of these loans that have been deferred during the lockdown, uh, and as he said, because of the recession, they now total 90% of the capital of the big four banks, those deferred loans. Now, that's $224 billion, um, which are loans held by 700, nearly 750,000 mortgagees and businesses. And he asks the question in the article, are these loans really deferred or are they really impaired loans? Because if they're considered as impaired loans... Um, if the normal accounting for loan impairments and provisions for bad and doubtful debt applies, then there's probably not much doubt the entire Australian banking system would be insolvent and the economy would be in a lot more trouble than it is now, he says. And he asks what would happen or what will happen when the deferral period ends. Uh, how many of them will be impaired at that point? How many people will be able to even resume their payments in September, we could be in for a financial crisis like no other. And the thing to understand is he's raising the point that this is represents 90% of the big four banks' capital, this amount of money we're talking about. And of course, if there's a lot of them that are impaired, the banks have to find new capital. And if there's a risk that the banks are on the edge of failure here, bail-in was invented as a way of turning deposits, which are a liability to the bank, into capital. They can convert them into capital, right? And you're told, oh, you've got a share now instead of a deposit, right? Whoopee. But of course, a deposit is something the bank owes you that amount of money. A share is today can be worth $5, tomorrow $50, the next day $0.05, cents, right. right? It's not the same thing at all. And that's the, um, this is what bail-in was invented for. And, and so the point is we've been blowing the whistle on bail-in for quite a few years now. The danger has not gone away and our banking system is so unpredictable because it's part of a complex global banking system, mm -hmm. right, which is riddled with derivatives and all these things and you've got more to go through. People have to understand this danger is still right there. And, I mean, that's also in the context that, <clears> as uh, the Bank for International Settlements has just pointed out, and we can put up the chart, Australian households are loaded with the second highest debt in the world. And I want to <coughs> mention New Zealand because the Reserve Bank of New Zealand uh, just issued in May its financial stability report. Um, and it's, um, there was a survey in conjunction with this that showed that the majority of New Zealand households are in financial crisis or are on the brink of one, and one in ten households have missed a mortgage or rent payment. But the RBNZ report says that New Zealand's facing the biggest decline in annual GDP for 160 years, and that will involve financial distress for a significant number of household and businesses. Yet the BIS puts us, you know, worse than uh, New Zealand yep. in that ranking. But under severe scenarios, says the RBNZ, the viability of banks would come into question. And in one scenario that sees unemployment rising to nearly 18% and house prices falling by almost half, 
they state that banks would fall below minimum capital requirements and would have to undertake significant recovery responses such as raising new capital from shareholders to avoid resolution options. Resolution is code for bail-in and New Zealand has the most drastic transparent bail-in law in the world. It's mm. called Open Bank Resolution and they're open. We'll take whatever we want to keep the bank going and whatever we don't, it, whatever we use, you're not getting back, right? That's, they're very transparent about it. Now on the 27th of February, the uh, One Nation Senator Malcolm Roberts tabled an amendment to the Australian bail-in laws uh, to specifically exclude deposits from being bailed in because as the legislation presently exists, um, there are enough loopholes that they could be included. Um, New Zealand explicitly yeah. takes deposits, Australia's is ambiguous, so we have to take out that ambiguity. Um, now we'll take a quick break, but we'll be right back to continue talking about this subject. Welcome back to the Citizens Report, where we're discussing how bail-in is a clear and present danger. Lisa, before we go on, I just want to mention with the, the bill that Senator Malcolm Roberts introduced on the 27th of February to amend the bail-in law, there's a chance that could be debated in Parliament in August, right? So this is something um, we need our viewers to uh, join us here in, um, you know, be able to do more than one thing at once. So we've got the campaign for National Bank, but this is still part of the, 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 the reform campaign we have. And it's very important that you start... Uh, if you haven't been doing it, calling members of parliament now to say that you must support that amendment because that amendment can close the loophole that will allow a backdoor bail-in of Australian deposits. And, um, you know, it would be good to have a real fierce debate about that in parliament and win in August if it gets to be debated. Mm, absolutely. And the urgency uh, behind this campaign for all this suite of financial reform that we've written legislation for are all ready to go and contact us for more background information on all of that legislation. We've got a, a report uh, called our bank manual that contains the, the most critical material. Um, but part of the backdrop of it is the uh, coming collapse or the ongoing collapse, I should say, of the global derivatives bubble, which is pure speculative activity. It's what brought down the system in 2008 and nothing changed since then. In fact, it's all gotten worse. And one specific type of derivative we want to discuss briefly is collateralised loan obligations or CLOs. It's part of the alphabet suit that brought down the system in 2008. Back then we were talking about collateralised debt obligations, CDOs, which were bundled up mortgages and people, you know, buy and sell them and trade in them and so forth. But the mortgages underlying them, of course, were dodgy as anything, subprime and could not be serviced at a certain point, so it all blew up. Now, there's been a warning that's just been issued in the Atlantic by a derivatives expert and Wall Street whistleblower by the name of Frank Partnoy, and it's titled The Looming Bank Collapse, in which he warns that the US financial system could be on the cusp of calamity. This time we might not be able to save it. And he's talking specifically about the threat of these CLOs. Now, of course, CLO, CLOs are the same as these mortgage-backed securities, but instead of bundling up mortgages, they're bundling up highly leveraged corporate debt, which means corporate bonds that are issued by companies that are heavily indebted already. Now, in May, we saw record corporate bankruptcies in the United States. Uh, the highest since 2008. We saw record defaults on leveraged loans, and we'll put up some graphs. We saw record defaults of corporate bonds and of the CLOs containing those bonds. In fact, they increased by 270% in the last year. And we saw a large Japanese bank, Norin Chukin Bank, having lost $3.7 billion on collateralised loan obligations. This is a bank that pulls funds from farmers and fishermen's cooperatives. Now, despite all of that, though, uh, we also saw a rec record issue in the US of new corporate bonds uh, in this last period since the US Fed, as part of the COVID bailout response, announced they would buy up $750 billion of corporate debts. Um, now, this, there's something new in all of this, which is really critical to think about, because 
In this COVID response plan, the US Treasury started working with the Fed to intervene in the markets to buy up corporate bonds. And it's actually legally dubious whether they're allowed to buy uh, corporate bonds. So they create a special purpose vehicle to do it at arm's length. But what they did is they, without having any contract, they uh, brought in the biggest asset manager, fund manager in the world, BlackRock, to do the purchasing for them. Most of the bonds that BlackRock has purchased so far are in BlackRock funds. So this is really, really dubious. And add to this the fact that BlackRock has also been hired by the Bank of Canada, the Swedish Central Bank and the European Central Bank to run their bond buying programs. And in August last year, at the Central Bankers Gathering in uh, Jackson Hole in the US, BlackRock had issued a paper saying it was called Dealing with the Next Downturn, saying that we need financial or monetary regime change where governments hand power to central banks to make fiscal decisions, i.e. where government spending goes. And this is what it's raising because as a number of commentators, I'll just cite three of them, are saying um, this is blurring the lines between monetary policy and fiscal policy. Matt Taibbi wrote an article about this in Rolling Stone on the 13th of May, how the COVID-19 bailout gave Wall Street a no-lose casino. And in a previous article, he said that this whole operation is a bank-state merger, which has converted Wall Street into a vehicle for annually privatising a big chunk of America's GDP into the hands of a few executives. Jim Bianco of Bianco Research from Bloomberg said, this scheme essentially merges the Fed and Treasury into one organisation. In effect, the Fed is giving the Treasury access to its printing press. And finally, economics columnist Steve Perlstein in the Washington Post in April said the Fed has assumed the role as a financial backstop and lender of last resort to every major corporation, along with the banks and investors that are behind them. He said it's no longer just banks that are too big to fail, it's now the entire corporate sector. Well, and the thing with these CLOs, Elisa, is um, in, we're trying to get a bit of a handle on who might be exposed to them in Australia. We know in 2008 a lot of Australian councils were exposed to these CDOs mm. um, and you know these are these are only marginally different and uh, you know unfortunately there's a, there's a gambling mentality in Australia as well right and so this we've we put out a release today on this bail-in danger and we've actually said you've got to factor that in as well um, in terms of what our we know our banks have a close to 40 trillion dollars in derivatives exposure you know, these are the hot spots in the global financial system. Where, where are they at? And, and just one comment in terms of BlackRock and the Federal Reserve. It's the difference between um, in the, you know, the 18th century, the, the, the pirates and the privateers, right? When they were just purely private operations, they were pirates going around looting for their own benefit. And when the British government wanted to use them for their benefit, then they just grabbed the same pirates and said, now you're legal, you're privateers, right? And that's how the Federal Reserve is using BlackRock in this operation. This is the financial oligarchy. These people are running the world to their um, uh, agenda for their benefit. Mm. And it's part of what we have to dismantle with our policies like Glass-Steagall, National Bank and ending bail-in. Exactly. And there's another argument here for why we need this National Bank urgently because Australian councils... You know, they had as a total over 10 to 15 per cent invested in collateralised debt obligations before the 2007 wipeout that they experienced because there's no longer any kind of ability for them to borrow from government. So they have to invest and speculate to have any cash whatsoever to put into the local works and the sorts of development they need to do. So we need to rectify that. So call your MP. Now, we'll take a quick break. We'll be right back to discuss a uh, foreign interference issue. Welcome back to the Citizens Report. We're now discussing the fixes in how foreign influence has rigged a parliamentary inquiry. Now, there's an Australian journalist sitting in maximum security prison in Britain right now, someone who is in critical uh, health condition and with COVID circulating throughout the prison, Julian Assange. And an a group of Australian MPs and counsellors, legal professionals, human rights advocates, journalists and publishers have recently issued an appeal saying the Australian government should be willing to intervene to protect the lives of Australians caught up in legal processes in foreign countries where those proceedings violate international law. 
Of course, Julian Assange exposed the reality of the fraudulent regime change wars, Iraq, etc. But it is not on his behalf over which the Australian Parliament is intervening right now. They're more concerned about the sidekick for a hedge fund fraudster, a guy named Magnitsky. Can you explain what this is all about, Robert? Yeah, so this was a case that happened um, back in 2008, 2007, 2008, where there's a Russian uh, accountant named Sergei Magnitsky. He was the accountant to a HSBC frontman named Bill Browder of Hermitage Capital in a, in a tax evasion scam, etc. Um, uh, he died in prison. And this Bill Browder, who was actually a, a fraudster, um, and we've got all the evidence there, uh, this Bill Browder... Uh, because he is a front for people like HSBC, he he has cynically used this case to go around the world and get parliaments to enact what's called a Magnitsky Law or a Magnitsky Act that allows governments, like such, such as Australia's, if we pass it here, to sanction individuals in foreign governments for human rights abuses. And your contrast to Julian Assange is, is, is perfectly apt because... Julian Assange exposed human rights abuses. He exposed war crimes. And we don't care about that. In fact, we cover those ones up because they're done by our allies. This, this, is, this kind of law is supreme hypocrisy to start with, but it's a nasty weaponising of human rights and it's faked human rights concerns. So in the case of the actual Browder case, the truth is the opposite of what's presented. He's, this, this guy, Browder, was involved in the tax evasion scam and, and, and this guy, Sergei Magnitsky, was his sidekick. There's a, um, there's a, there's a documentary that we've referred to before called the Magnitsky Act Behind the Scenes, which exposes all this. But in Australia, we've had, we've had an inquiry and we have an article in this week's issue of the Alert Service, Elisa, which people can call in and get a free copy of if they haven't before, by West Australian researcher Melissa Harrison, um, on just how much this inquiry has been completely rigged from the get-go so that us passing this Magnitsky Act is a foregone conclusion because... We've been told to do it by the Five Eyes. And, of course, the Five Eyes is the intelligence spying gang of, dominated by the United States and the United Kingdom. It includes Australia, Canada and New Zealand. And we want this to sort of create this, this, this sort of, think of it like an, an international police apparatus where we can go around um, fingering anybody that our governments decide they don't like with this kind of power, right? And in Australia, they... Um, uh, they've coordinated... Melissa exposes how they've coordinated the submissions so that... All, there's a lot of submissions made, and we made some. Uh, we made one as well, but most of them have used the same language to get this um, up. They suppressed evidence, and I want, just want to highlight: there's a really top investigative reporter in New York City named Lucy Commissar, who has a CV a mile long. I mean, you know, this this woman is a legend in investigative reporting and in financial investigative reporting. She made a submission to this inquiry, fundamentally exposing Bill Browder and the whole fraud he represents. And this submission was suppressed and suppressed and suppressed. It's finally been published in a redacted form. Bill Browder was given a chance to respond to it um, only after it was sitting there for months and months and months and being sat on because they wanted to make sure that when I had a hearing a few weeks ago, this didn't come up, mm. that, the, that, that the politicians didn't question Mr Browder based on this kind of evidence, right? And so now Kimberly Kitching, who's one of these wolverines, and the wolverines are America's little furry pets in the Australian Parliament, right? Uh, uh, Andrew Hastie, uh, James Patterson, Kimberly Kitching, she's put up this bill in September. She'll put up this bill in September and it's a foregone conclusion it'll pass. We are being dictated to by the Five Eyes. Yep, don't let it happen. Call in for more information and tune in again next week.